Hey everyone, welcome back to Learn With Me. I'm Deborah Hansen, and today we're going to talk about AP Psychology 2.8 Intelligence and Achievement. And maybe you've been following along the entire unit. If you do want the full uh, slideshow, you can get that from the link below from my Teacher Pay Teacher Store. And that is, it will include everything that I'm basically talking about on the slides and has a little workbook that you can work along with it. So whether you're studying for just a unit test right now or you're studying for the final exam, it doesn't matter. Hopefully you'll find these helpful. And if you do, please give me a like or and subscribe to the channel. Um, that really does help me a lot. I will be adding more content as we go along. I'm also an SAT uh, tutor, so I'll be adding some SAT things, um, some SAT content coming up really soon. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to start always by looking at the CED questions, the questions that the College Board has put out for this section of the unit. And this section of the unit 2.8 has four CED questions. So I'm going to go through each one and the essential knowledge that the College Board wants you to know to be able to answer these questions. And this is, we know, this is what they use to make the test. They use the CED to create the test, your MCQs, your FRQs, whatever. So it's really important to know what they want you to know. So we're gonna start with the first one, explain how modern and historical theories describe intelligence. Mm -hmm. Okay, and these are going to be the key terms for the entire 2.8, and I'll make a separate video where we can talk about, where I'll actually give you an example, a description, definition, so that you can put on your flashcards so that you know. It's important for you to be able to uh, basically apply these uh, terms in the FRQs. So it's really good to have the the uh, note cards. And what I kind of always suggest to my students is to just make like, you know, the note cards that are attached by coil is just do one for each unit. So all the key terms for unit one and two and three and four and five. So, and you just kind of keep going like that and you have them all together. So it really does make it easier. Okay, let's start with the historical view of intelligence. So basically, it was set, it's centered on a single dimension of cognitive ability, and it was introduced by Charles Spearman with the concept of G, or general intelligence, and it's suggesting a single core mental ability which underlines all uh, cognitive tasks. Okay, so now we're going to look at some modern theories. Oops, so modern theories of intelligence. Let's look at Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. That's from 1983. He proposes that intelligence is not a single general ability, but several specific abilities. So initially, it, he identified seven types of intelligence, such as linguistic, logical, mathematical, spatial. And basically, he talked about how each of the learning situations happened in different um with different types of intelligence. So it's actually really interesting, uh, the work that he did. The other one is Robert Sternberg's uh, triarchic, uh, sorry, well, sorry about that. Robert Sternberg's triartic theory of intelligence. That was categorizing intelligence into three types, analytical, creative, and practical. And he suggests that intelligence involves different cognitive processes that help adapt to shape and, cho and, and, choose, and choose the environments. Okay, six, we're going to look at the ongoing debates on whether intelligence should be viewed as a single entity or composite of multiple skills. So the discussions also address cultural and contextual biases and how intelligence is defined and measured, underscoring the challenges in assessing intelligence across diverse populations. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at all of the different breakdown of how do we assess intelligence and how does that work? So we're going to go into the second CED question. The second CED question is explain how intelligence is measured. So let's look at that. So we're going to start by saying under, we have to understand intelligence measurements, right? So what is intelligence testing? Well, intelligence tests are tools that are designed to assess individuals' mental capabilities and compare them with others in the population. So these tests aim to measure a variety of cognitive abilities, including reasoning, understanding, and problem solving. Okay. Thanks. So we're going to look at the evolution of intelligence testing. So early methods. So initially, intelligence was assessed by calculating the intelligence quotient or your IQ, which was the ratio of mental age to chronicle age multiplied by 100. This method was intended to measure intellectual development compared to peers of the same chronological age. So you were tested with people who were your age. So that's how they calculated your IQ. Modern IQ tests today are standardized and scored based on a normative sample of the population, so meaning that scores reflect how a test taker performs relative to others. These scores are really important for identifying students who might benefit from special educational services or enrichment programs. 
the key principles in psychological testing. So we look at standardization. A test is standardized when the same procedures and conditions are consistently used during its administration across all test takers. Perfect example, and some of you might be studying for this, is the SAT, right? The test is standardized. Everybody's getting the same test. You're you're under the same um test taking situations. So that would be a standardized test. We also look at the validity. The validity refers to the accuracy of a test in measuring what it's supposed to measure. So we have two types of validity. We have construct validity, which does the test accurately assess the theoretical construct it claims to measure. So for example, does an IQ test really measure intelligence as it is theoretically defined? defined? Or predictive validity. This refers to the ability of a test to predict future performances or outcomes. So for instance, does the SAT predict college success? Hmm. Debatable. <laughs> okay, we're going to also look at the key. Oh, so more, we're going to go into more key principles, sorry, of psychological testing. So we're going to look at real, uh, reliability concerns and the consistency of a test's results. So test, retest, reliability. This means if the test is taken more than once, do the results stay the same? This helps ensure the test results are reproducible. And again, sorry to bring back the SAT here, but it's the one that you probably do take multiple times. And we generally see the kids who take it multiple times, you might go up like maybe 100, 150 points. And that's generally how it's going to be, 50 to 150, unless you really, really put a lot of effort into it. And we have, I, I mean, I've seen some of my students jump huge numbers, but it's not generally the case. So you're generally going to be around where you've scored. That's the test retest reliability. Split half reliability. This measures the internal consistency of the test. If you split the test in half, do both halves have similar results? So we're also going to look at sociocultural considerations in testing. So bias and fairness. So tests must be socially, socioculturally responsive to ensure that they do not unfairly benefit or disadvantage any group. So this includes being mindful of language, cultural context, and educational backgrounds to avoid biases. So stereotype, threat, and lift. That means that when researchers strive to mitigate stereotype threats, where individuals underperform because of negative stereotypes, types about their group and lifts where individuals perform better because of positive stereotypes. Addressing these can help ensure the fairness and equity of intelligence assessments. Measuring intelligence involves complex and meticulously designed assessments that must be continually revised and to ensure fairness and accuracy. Understanding these tests, designs, applications, and implications helps psychologists and educators make informed decisions about individuals' cognitive capabilities and needs. Okay, we're going to go into uh, CED question number three now. So explain how systemic issues relate to the quantitative and qualitative uses of intelligence assessment. So here we go. We're going to look at, first of all, the Flynn effect. So what is the Flynn effect? Over the past century, IQ scores have generally increased worldwide, a phenomenon known as the Flynn effect. This rise is attributed to various societal improvements, such as increased access to education, better health care, and improved nutrition. The implications of this, this implies that intelligence is not solely a matter of genetic inheritance, but is significantly shaped by the conditions and experience to which a person is exposed during their lifetime. Here's our nature versus nurture that we talked about in unit one. Okay. We're going to look at validity, sorry, variability within between groups. Observations. So research shows that IQ scores tend to vary more within a single group than between groups. This means that individual differences within a racial or socioeconomic group are often greater than the differences between these groups. The significance of this is that this highlights that categorizing intelligence based solely on group characteristics like ethnicity or na national origin can be misleading and oversimplify the complex nature of intelligence. So what is the impact of sociocultural bias? Personal and cultural biases. The way IQ tests are designed and interpreted can be influenced by personal and cultural biases of those conducting the assessments. This can affect the fairness and accuracy of the results. For example, a test that primarily, primarily uses cultural references familiar to a specific group may disadvantage those from different backgrounds. 
Let's look at the influence of socioeconomic factors, poverty and education, for example. Socioeconomic status, including factors like poverty and educational opportunities, can significantly impact IQ scores. Poor educational resources can limit intellectual development, skewing IQ test results, and reinforcing social inequalities. Broader impact would be these disparities can lead to cycles of disadvantage where the lower scores limit opportunities for upward mobility. The consequences of misusing IQ tests. So historical misuse first. Throughout history, IQ tests have been used to justify eugenics policies, restrict immigration, and segregate individuals into different educational tracks or employment opportunities based on their perceived innate intelligence. So basically, your IQ determined many things for you. But the contemporary issues basically are that such practices have perpetuated discrimination, limited access to resources and opportunities, and for those labels having lower intelligence, really uh, put a stop to their their uh, ability to move forward. And of course, that's not good because <laughs> your IQ is not who you are. Okay. Ethical considerations. So the, what is the responsibility of psychologists? Psychologists and educators must be aware of these biases and work to mitigate their effects by developing fairer, more inclusive testing methods. And for future directions, we need to include using intelligence assessments that account for diverse cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds to provide a more accurate representation of an individual's cognitive abilities. Okay, so just a little wrap up here of this question. By examining how systematic factors influence the application and interpretation of intelligent assessments, students can better understand the ethical, cultural, and practical challenges associated with these tests. It's crucial for future psychologists to recognize these complexities to foster fairer and more equitable practices in psychological testing. So on to the last CD question of this section, CD question number four, explain how academic achievement is measured and experienced as compared to intelligence. Okay, so we're going to look at academic achievement versus intelligence. We're going to look at a couple different sections here of this question. So understanding the measurement of academic achievement compared to intelligence involves recognizing the different purposes and influences behind these assessments. So let's start with number one, the types of tests. So we have two types of tests. We have achievement tests, which these are designed to assess what someone has learned in a specific area of study, such as math, reading, or science. Achievement tests measure a student's knowledge and skills in particular subjects, reflecting their uh, educational background and the effectiveness of prior instruction. So we think of that just normal tests, like you're probably going to be taking a unit two test, right? To see what have you learned, how are you bringing in your schema from other things? It is testing the knowledge and skills that you've learned in psychology. An aptitude test is, in contrast, they, they aim to predict a student's ability to succeed in the future. So particularly in new environments or new learning environments for that matter. These tests attempt to gauge potential rather than current knowledge, and they assess the abilities like reasoning, understanding complex ideas, and problem solving. So sometimes these aptitude tests are really good to see what, what career you might want to go into, right? So are you, what kind of learner are you? How are you going to, to like, you know, succeed in the future? What do you, what, what skills do you possess that would might affect one career over another? Second, what we're going to look at is the measurement of intelligence. Intelligence tests assess broader cognitive abilities that are not tied to a specific curriculum, but are thought to underlie overall mental capabilities. These include problem-solving skills, memory, and the ability to learn new information. While aptitude tests are somewhat similar, they are usually more focused on predicting future academic or occupational success. So we think about this. It's not really just about, for example, psychology or math or English. It really is looking at how do you solve problems? How does your how do you memorize things? How do you learn new information for all subjects? Okay, the third one is the influence of mindsets on academic achievement. So we're going to talk about fixed versus growth mindset. So first of all, fixed mindset. Some people believe that intelligence is a fixed trait. It's set at birth and it's unchangeable over time. This mindset can limit students as they may feel that no amount of effort can change their innate ability, potentially leading to lower motivation and academic performance. 
versus growth mindset. Those with a growth mindset believe that intelligence can be developed through effort, learning, and persistence. This view fosters resilience and a commitment to learning as individuals see challenges as opportunities to grow in their abilities. Students have shown that encouraging a growth mindset, sorry, sorry, studies have shown that encouraging a growth mindset can lead to higher academic achievement. And this is the mindset we need to really encourage in our students is to, to really believe in yourself and to that if you put in the effort, I always say to my kids, what you put into something is what you get out of it. So really that effort, that learning, that persistence to do well. We talked about it before with these scores on the SAT standardized test. You, If you put in a lot of effort, you can see your score go up. But it's the same with the AP exam. You can't put in a little bit and expect a five on the test. You've got to put in the effort. The, you have to learn. You've got to be persistent. And if you're watching my videos, you're probably already there because, you know, I mean, you're absolutely, you're, you're trying to learn and understand the material. So well done. And the last one is the educational implications. Understanding these different perspectives helps educators tailor their teaching methods to foster more effective learning. So for instance, praising students for their effort rather than their innate ability can encourage a growth mindset, potentially improving academic outcomes. And that is so important as a teacher. I mean, that's we want to be able to bring out the best in our students, but you also have to want to bring out the best in you. Okay, let's look at this. Next slide. So we're just going to wrap up this one. For AP psychology students, it's crucial to understand that while achievement tests measure acquired knowledge from schooling, intelligent tests, intelligence tests assess broader cognitive abilities or capabilities. Additionally, the belief is that malleability of intelligence growth mindset can significantly influence one's motivation and performance in education settings. These concepts are foundational in educational psychology and can shape approaches to teaching and learning. And hopefully you are in a class where your teacher is really pushing that growth mindset and encouraging you and supporting you in your journey in AP psychology, but also just in all learning. So hopefully this helped you today. So thank you so much. That's the end of 2.8, actually the end of unit two. We'll get on to unit three next. I hope you found this helpful. Please leave me a comment if you did, or if you want me to do some different videos, I'm also always happy to do that. If you have any questions, I answer everybody. And uh, if you really like my content, please, please, please subscribe to my channel. I love watching the numbers go up. I get quite excited. I think my kids think it's funny. But anyway, I hope this was helpful for you. I hope you have a really great day and good luck on your tests. Have a great day. See you next time.